I really like the Christmas season. The holiday season, it provides a nice time to reflect on what's gone on over the past year. It's a nice way to enjoy our friends and relax with them. And it's a time where we can at least try to enjoy time with our families. There's usually gorgeous displays in the windows at Macy's in New York City. Same in London, here in, here in London at Harrods, there's beautiful windows that remind us of the fantasies of Christmas. And even the National Christmas Tree in Washington, D.C., against the Capitol building, provides us an, a, a modicum of hope in these troubled times. Christmas, the holiday season, can be really lovely. One other aspect I really like about the holiday season, though, are Christmas cards. I enjoy getting Christmas cards from family and friends all over the world. It's nice to reconnect with people whose lives I've intersected with, at least at some point. But something happened in the 1990s. We all got personal computers, and we also got printers. So now, we have the Instead of having to handwrite all of our Christmas cards, at least in the United States, what a lot of people have done is done tailor-made letters to provide greetings for the holiday season. And I refer to these as Christmas letters, okay? Christmas letters, when they come in the mail, you can spot them a mile away because they're usually in a nice, brightly colored envelope. They have perfectly calligraphied addresses on them. They have little stickers to separate them, and seasonal postage up in the right-hand corner. They look beautiful when they come. And what's the first thing you see when you open one of these letters? The family photo, okay? Don't they all look happy? Do you think, do you think all seven, count them, seven of these people are this happy all year long? Do you think they wear those cute little dresses and those cute little suits with their ties every day? No. <laughs> well, in addition to this beautiful picture, there's also the letter, okay? Read along with me for one of the letters, one of the, what, what these letters are like. Dear beloved friends, things are going smashingly on all fronts for our family. The children, of course, continued to be the highlights of the story. This would be a book if I listed all their accomplishments, so I'll just give you the highlights. And then they go on to tell us about little Dalton, okay? Little Dalton is now 17, he's finished all of his college applications for early decision, and he's just fretting over whether, how to choose between MIT and Princeton. What a dilemma. And his little sister, Astrid, 15, is apparently turning into quite the beauty, ready to compete in the Miss America contest. So we need to stay tuned to see if she's there next year, even though she's a little underage. But, you know, she's perfect. And then it uh, goes on to talk about this. My husband and I have had outstanding <laughs> years at work. We never knew bonuses could be so big. Okay? In addition to my charity work in Sierra Leone, my fundraising, my organic garden, yoga classes, and beekeeping, I still find time to be president of the PTA, treasurer for the local National Rifle Association, and secretary of the Gated Community Security Committee. Hmm. We had to say goodbye to my husband's mother, but we just rejoice in the long life that she lived. So, from our home to yours, have a blessed holiday season. We'll be praying for you. Okay. So when I read these letters, I don't always believe everything that I read in them. I mean, did Dalton really apply early decision to all those colleges? Does he have a realistic chance of having to choose between Princeton and MIT? Is Astrid really that good looking? What the hell is she doing in Sierra Leone? I have <laughs> no idea. So say, what is going on with this letter? So I just sort of file all that stuff in the back of my head. And then the Christmas season winds down. The Christmas tree kind of fades. And I put away Christmas ornaments. And I take these letters and put them where I think they belong. <laughs> and then the new year comes upon us. And 
everything starts fresh again. Right? But no, this whole Christmas letter thing starts happening again. How does this happen again? Well, usually around the end of January, I start getting annual reports from all the companies in which I own some stock. Now, being an accountant, I like annual reports. I like to take a look at the information that's contained in them. So I'm very happy to look at a balance sheet, an income statement, statement of cash flows, and a statement of stockholders' equity. And since I'm an accountant, I know the language of GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, so I'm very happy to read something in my language. Okay? So let's start with this balance sheet for a minute. A balance sheet is a snapshot of a company at a single point in time, one single moment in time. And it provides sort of an example of the resources and obligations of a company at one point in time. And then usually you get a comparative balance sheet so that you can compare the company at two very distinct points in time, usually a year apart. Well, guess what? That's kind of like the family picture last year and the family picture this year. <laughs> Something's changed, right? Because they're not exactly identical, but you don't know what's changed. Well, if you look at balance sheets, if you're trying to interpret what's happened between two balance sheet dates, you look at the income statement. The income statement is a summary of what's happened during the year. It's like the movie of the family during the year. A statement, income statement usually summarizes revenues and expenses and then reports profits. But you know what that's like? It's like the letter. It's like the Christmas letter that we opened. And then there's this statement of cash flows. The statement of cash flows kind of zeroes in on one of the most important assets a company owns, which is its cash. Okay? And it provides us some information about how cash flows in and out of a company. Well, isn't that what that Christmas letter said? That the children were the stars of the show? And then finally, the statement of stockholders' equity. This is something that reports transactions between the owners of a company and the company itself. So if a company issues new stock, capital flows into the company. If the company pays a dividend, cash flows out of the company. Well, I look at this and think, you know what? That's kind of like the family tree. And the capital flowing into the company are the new additions. And the capital flowing out of the company is grandma. <laughs> okay? So I look at this and think, you know, I, I sort of had some questions when I read my Christmas letters just a few weeks ago. I wonder if annual reports are kind of doing the same thing. I wonder if they're sort of overstating accomplishments and maybe painting a picture that's just a little too beautiful. Okay? So here's an example. Can you guess this company? Try to guess this company. I'm going to give you some quotes that came from an actual annual report. Okay? The company's net income reached a record $1.3 billion. We continued our record of strong returns. Recurring earnings per share have increased steadily. Nobody's eyes are glazing over yet with these accounting terms, so I'm happy about that. The great fun here will be for all of us to discover just how great we are, how good we can really be. And then a comparison of the company's return versus the S&P 500. This company looks like it's doing really well, doesn't it? Any idea what company this is? On April 2nd, 2001, they released their annual report for the year 2000. Very good. Six months later, they said they had to restate everything because it was all a lie. <laughs> okay? But their annual report was beautiful, very colorful, full of glossy pictures. Okay? So what, what kind of tricks do companies have to, to write their own Christmas letters? Well, it falls into kind of two broad categories. One are what I call real decisions. That's where you sort of alter the physical, um, the physical nature of a transaction so that when it gets reported, it looks different. And here's an example of one. Diamond Foods, which is a uh, producer of canned nuts, shifted payments to their walnut growers until later periods so it looked like 
they were more profitable in a year when they were in negotiations for a merger with uh, Procter & Gamble. So they used that real decision of delaying payments to make it look more profitable in the current year. Another example is that companies can play fast and loose with some accounting rules. For example, WorldCom used its cash flow statement to part some expenses. Instead of expensing them on the income statement and making the income and the profit look lower, the company instead regarded those as a capital expenditure and kind of left them off the income statement, at least temporarily. Okay? So that was an accounting decision that helped influence what earnings looked like. Okay? Some companies prefer to interpret things the way they want to interpret them. I mentioned earlier that the language of accounting is GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. And the Tesla company, poor Elon Musk, he's already been slammed once here. I guess he's <laughs> going to get slammed again. They reported their GAAP net loss per share, the net loss per share according to the rules of accounting. But then they also provided this adjustment for, to remove stock-based compensation so that this new measure of earnings looks better than the GAAP measure of earnings. They label it, you know, they show us that it's GAAP and non-GAAP, but, but they, they're at least trying to alter the, the rules under which they report things. And in their annual report, in their quarterly report before this particular quarter, they, they boasted that their net loss had narrowed. Okay? We're still not doing well, but at least we're not doing as bad as we were before. That's the good news. Okay? So what can you do when you look at these annual reports from companies? Well, I think you can hold on to the same skepticism that you use when you look at these Christmas letters. There's usually a lot of hyperbole and overstatement that I think is worthy of a little bit of scrutiny. You should keep your mind open for the different ways that companies can alter their results, at least on paper. And the most important part, and it's the part that most people neglect to do, is to look at those boring notes in the back of a set of financial statements. That's where the dirt is. That's where you find the stuff that you can tie back to the financial statements and try to convince yourself of what the real story is. So when you get your, your Christmas cards this year, I hope you think of annual reports. And if you ever get any annual reports, I hope you'll remember your Christmas cards. Thank you very much.